Hi, this is Rachel, and today we're going to cover topic one on professionalism. So when we talk about professionalism, this topic is written sort of from, from the perspective of providers that will be providing direct services to clients. For some individuals, you may already be in a setting where you are familiar with these concepts, um, but it's a nice review and it's great for individuals who might not have worked in a professional setting serving clients directly. Um, my background has been primarily in in-home settings, though I have um, supported center-based programs and school-based uh, programs, but um, the bulk of my work has been with in-home. So a lot of this might have a little bit of an in-home perspective with regards to this particular topic, but the concepts apply across settings. So professionalism, you need to be dependable. You need to make sure that you're keeping your appointments, that you're showing up on time. Confidentiality is super important as well. We're not gonna discuss an individual with anyone that we don't have permission to discuss them with. Um, you will, and, and that's before the fact. So you can't just mention it to somebody and then say, oh, hey, would it be okay if I talked to this person about you? Same thing applies with regards to providers, other providers that you work with or colleagues in the field. Um, you can't talk about those clients with regard uh, to those other colleagues or peers without permission. We also don't want to gossip. We don't want to talk about people behind their back. We don't want to talk about things in a negative context. It's detrimental to the overall success of the program. Individuals, their families, their caretakers should be treated with respect at all times and they should be spoken about respectfully. Even if you aren't with them at that moment or even if you don't think that the individual can understand, you should always be speaking as if the individual is part of that conversation. They can understand everything and um, they should be spoken of and to with respect. You need to be flexible. Flexibility is really key when we talk about providing services. Um, Service-based programs need to be flexible to meet the needs of the learner, to meet the needs of their family, their caregivers, to meet the needs of the setting. So things are constantly changing. Our goal is to change to support the individual, not to get the individual to change to make our lives easier. So we need to make sure that we are remaining flexible so that we can support our learners. Feedback is also a component of that, especially when you're working with individuals where they might have a changing needs, um, sometimes very frequent changing needs. Feedback is especially important to make sure that we are always um, addressing what needs to be addressed. So receiving feedback from your supervisor or even from peers is very helpful to help improve your skill set so that you can better serve that individual. Other factors that come in to professionalism is arriving on time. When we're talking about therapeutic based services, if the learner needs this therapy, this therapeutic service, then you need to be on time and you need to be working and supporting that individual that whole time so that they are getting the um, services for the amount of time that they need. Data collection in behavior analytic services um, and behavior analysis is very important. You want to accurately record the data during the session, not at the end. Um, that way we know that we have accurate data and we can make database decisions from that. You should also be able to 
read and interpret the data at least a little bit so that you can note anything that's unusual. You can record um, ABC data, which we'll talk about in the future, how to take that. Um, that you'll also be able to notice and make note of and direct people, uh, other con the, your consultants and your peers, um, technicians and the parents, if there's new behaviors that occur so that we can take a look at those and help support the individual um, as quickly as possible. You also want to make sure that you're maintaining contact with your supervisor, um, especially if changes need to be made or if there are any questions surrounding the program. Never as a technician level until you're the consultant or you have specific permission, never modify the treatment protocol. There's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, technicians don't necessarily have the skills to know what should be changed, when it should be changed, why it should be changed. So we don't want somebody who doesn't have training making decisions that could negatively affect how the learner is being supported. Another reason for this is that we want to make sure that if and when things change, that everybody is on the same page and everything changes um, at one time for that individual. It can be very confusing if person A is running a program one way and person B is running a program a different way. It's very confusing for the learner they're not going to benefit from those supports as much because they're getting mixed messages. A third reason why we don't mo modify the protocol without the consultant is because the consultant has to get um, consent and assent. So we need to get consent from the caregivers, the legal guardians to whatever program we are changing um, so that they are aware of what that looks like and how that's going to change. And you need to get assent from the individual themselves um, as much as possible with that learner's skill set before you change a strategy. You need to make sure that they are able to participate that and are um, assenting to that activity. With regard to service-based programs, meetings, it's super important to attend meetings. This also applies to supervision meetings, but you wanna make sure that you're there during those meetings, team meetings, whatever you want to call them, so that everybody is on the same page, all providers and trainees, and everybody is getting the same information at the same time so that changes can be made cleanly at one time instead of having people doing different things in different uh, with the learner but in different ways. So for assignments we want to read the BACB ethics code for behavior analysts. You want to identify and describe three characteristics for direct care providers, direct service providers, behavior technicians, whatever term you want to use, to display with learners. Also, three characteristics to display to families and three characteristics to display to consultants. So if we look at the BACB website, BACB.com, you can click on ethics and ethics codes and scroll down you will see the ethic code that goes into effect January 2022. So we're going to look at this code. Here's what it looks like. Ethics code for behavior analysts. Um, there's a few things that I want to highlight. Um, first of all, this particular code I think has been um, done a great job of creating these core principles, identifying these core principles. So previously, our ethics code had a lot of do this, don't do that type stuff. This code solidifies core principles and it says there's four foundational principles which we should strive to embody um, and those serve as the framework for the rest of the standards. 
which means that that can help provide guidance for individuals when um, a code may not be very clear as to how to proceed when there's an ethical dilemma and they're trying to make a decision about balancing certain codes and when things are maybe not covered specifically. So the first of the core principles is benefit others. Our work should be benefiting others and those others should be the individuals that we are serving, not just their caretakers. So sometimes we might be asked to decrease behaviors because an individual who serves that learner doesn't like to deal with those behaviors. That doesn't mean that those behaviors need to be decreased. They may be absolutely appropriate for that learner and maybe very um, important skills for that learner to have. Our goal is not to benefit the caretakers. Our goal is to benefit the individuals we are serving. And it goes into um, a lot of detail here, work on maximizing benefits and do no harm. This is also really important when we start talking about some of the uh, controversy around ABA. Um, I think that a lot of times it comes from uh, not serving the individual and instead trying to serve other people. And by trying to serve the other people in the environment, we're not benefiting at best and at worst doing harm to the individuals that we should be serving. The second of the core principles, treat others with compassion, dignity, and respect. Um, and it goes into what that looks like. Specifically, we're talking about not being discriminatory, um, respecting and actively promoting the client's self-determination to the best of their abilities, which means that we're teaching our learners to advocate for themselves. And we need to make sure that we are providing and helping to support our learners with those self-advocacy skills, regardless of other factors. The third core principle is to behave with integrity. So we fulfill our responsibilities to the scientific professional communities, to science in general, and to the communities and individuals that we serve. We need to be honest. We need to be trustworthy. We need to not misrepresent ourselves. We need to follow through on obligations and hold ourselves accountable for our work and correct our errors and anybody that we're responsible for, um, correct those errors in a timely manner. The fourth and final um, core principle is to ensure competence. Um, so this could be its own whole topic, um, but ensuring your competence, you need to be aware of what your limits are, um, what populations you can and cannot serve, what settings you can and cannot serve, um, based upon your skill set, your knowledge, your experience. Um, so we have to make sure that we're practicing within our scope of competence, um, that we are remaining current and increasing our knowledge in best practices. I think this is another area where the controversies around ABA come up. Best practice is not necessarily what you were taught when you first entered the field. Um, best practice may not be what you have been taught recently. It is up to you to make sure that you are staying up with the literature, going to conferences, learning about best practice, and not just doing something because that's the way I was taught, or that's the way my supervisor did it, or that's the way we've always done it. Those are not good reasons. Those are not best practice. You might be using best practice, but you need to know that you are doing best practice. 
Um, we also want to make sure that we are continually um, assessing our competence and checking ourselves when we might be um, stretching too far without the right supports. So I can, I should um, be able to identify the populations that I can support, that I have experience with, that I have training around, um, the settings where I have provided services, where I've been trained to provide services. And I should, if I want to move outside of those parameters, that I am getting the training and the support and the mentorship to do that in a systematic fashion. And I am not accepting cases that I don't have the skill set to deal with appropriately because our learners need our um, best practice and they need the best supports that they can get. And we need to be honest if we can't provide those. Another thing that I really like about this ethics code is it actually does break down um, steps for ethical decision making. And I have another topic about that that goes into a lot of detail about ethics and ethical decision making. But this is the first ethics code that has outlined a procedure um, following the steps of what to do if you face an ethical dilemma. So clearly define the issue, consider the potential risk of harm to the relevant individuals, make sure you've identified all of the relevant individuals and consider their perspectives, gather supporting documentation, follow up on any secondhand information, make sure there's actually an ethical concern. You have to also consider your own personal learning history and the biases that you are bringing to this situation. Identify the relevant core principles and the code standards. Consult available resources to try to get additional information and see how best to um, handle the situation. Develop several, pro several possible actions to reduce or remove the risk of harm. Prioritizing the best interest of the clients in accordance with the code and applicable laws. Critically evaluate each possible action by considering its alignment with the code and its impact on the learner and the stakeholders. Select the action that seems most likely to resolve the code and reduce the likelihood of similar issues arising in the future. Take that action with those individuals, document what you're doing, and then evaluate the outcomes to ensure that the action successfully addresses the issue. So like I said, there's another topic where I go into a lot more detail about ethics, but this is great and it's really good that our um, code is giving an outline for how to resolve these issues and also that the very first things are all about making sure you're considering who is actually at risk of being harmed and all the relevant individuals and checking your own learning history and biases because this is something that we need to improve upon as a field. We need to be aware of the fact that we carry bias and that that can affect our judgment. So that was topic one. I will continue to post these topics as we work through the uh, supervision curriculum. And let me know if you have any questions or feedback. Um, obviously, there's a lot more to the ethics code. There's stuff that I didn't read from the topic. Those are for you to read. Um, and I am here to elaborate upon and emphasize certain areas and point out key areas that we should be attending to. Thanks.